This is a follow-up uh, to the first video on the integument of vertebrates. The first video uh, focused primarily on the epidermis and the dermis, the layers of the cutaneous membrane, and talked about fish scales. Obviously, the uh, original uh, vertebrates uh, were fish. Uh, and uh, went through different kinds of uh, scales in fish. Um, before leaving the idea of scales, just a quick recap. Um, the teleost fish today, uh, which are the most common uh, fish, uh, their scales are uh, complex. Uh, there's a living epithelia uh, over them, um, and the scale is of dermal origin. It has acellular non-calcified bone. But uh, fish scales have varied in uh, the past. The original scale, uh, scales, uh, which we find in the fossil record and which are then seen in sharks, are these placoid scales. Placoid scales are interesting because in addition to having bone and its calcified um, uh, bone uh, in uh, the uh, fish I'll uh, mention uh, next, um, and having uh, enamel and dentin. Uh, it thus uh, is the precursor of teeth. And so before there were true teeth with enamel and dentin, um, the scales of early fish had enamel and dentin uh, in them, as do the placoid scales of sharks today. The enamel comes from the epidermis, the dentin uh, and in others, the underlying bone comes from uh, the dermis. And so uh, the um, uh, teeth, which are absent in the jawless fish and absent in placoderms, uh, evolve from scales near the mouth, which got larger to grip uh, uh, prey. Uh, there are still bony fish alive today, uh, such as the uh, uh, sturgeons and gars, which have the enamel and dentin uh, still in their uh, scales, uh, and uh, therefore they're uh, a brighter white, um, but they also happen to be rigid and more interlocking, which limits their uh, mobility. Uh, this is what's known as a ganoid scale. Uh, the ancestors of amphibians uh, were the sarcopterygian fish, which had more dentin and less enamel, that's known as a cosmoid scale, and some of the early amphibians and even early reptiles could have fish scales on their underside, these cosmoid scales. Uh, the teleos alive uh, today, uh, they uh, are missing uh, the enamel, they are missing the dentin, and the bone doesn't have calcium in it, nor does it have cells, so it's missing the cellular layer, the um, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, then uh, missing the calcium, so it's just a cellular non-calcified bone primarily made of uh, collagen. And uh, then uh, there are uh, different types of uh, scales in uh, teleos uh, today. Uh, the roughened uh, edges are present on a psych, uh, I'm sorry, tenoid scales, um, and then the smoother edges on the cycloid scales. Um, but this then, uh, and so here would be a sarcopterygian uh, fish, a lung fish. Uh, it has those cosmoid scales with more dentin as opposed to the sturgeon, uh, which has the ganoid scales. Um, and as I would mentioned in the previous video, there are uh, fish which lose their uh, scales uh, and are essentially scaleless, such as eels and some catfish, although there are uh, catfish which uh, possess a very prominent uh, scales. Now on to uh, reptiles. Uh, uh, reptile scales are uh, different and they are epidermal. And the scales of reptiles was a great advance because if you look at amphibian skin, it needs to be kept smooth and moist because the uh, amphibians perform a significant amount of respiration through their skin. In fact, the lungless salamanders in the family Plethodontidae, they don't even have lungs. Uh, they've lost their lungs and they do all of their breathing through the skin. Um, but that then limits them. They need to be kept uh, uh, moist. And so therefore dry environments are a challenge for amphibians, which are trying to breathe through moist skin. Uh, these um, 
uh, this uh, skin here uh, is uh, much more waterproof. And so you're much more likely to find reptiles in deserts, uh, let's say in arid areas compared to amphibians. Now, uh, in order to grow, uh, these scales need to be shed from time to time. And so as uh, snake scales uh, tend to be shed uh, entire, as I'll show you in the, uh, uh, the video in just a second, uh, while those of lizards tend to be shed more uh, in pieces. Uh, now, scales can uh, vary. Uh, in turtles, scales can form these large epidermal scutes, which go over the dermal bone. And so a turtle shell is made of the vertebral column and thickened ribs, and then dermal bone in the skin, um, and then uh, this uh, covered by uh, epidermal, uh, uh, epidermal uh, scutes uh, as uh, well. As I'll uh, mention, uh, every time a rattlesnake uh, sheds, uh, it has uh, a bead added uh, to uh, the tip of its tail uh, from uh, the previous um, epidermal uh, covering. So these uh, rattles can uh, get larger as the snake uh, gets uh, older. So the reptilian uh, scale, uh, this was a great advance uh, for the reptiles uh, because now they uh, could inhabit drier uh, environments. And as uh, amniotes adapted to uh, land, they did so in a number of uh, systems of their body, but the integument obviously uh, helped. The keratin uh, that makes up uh, the skin was found in fish. So, you know, keratin is a protein of uh, the epidermis. Um, and not only is it uh, found uh, within uh, cells known as the keratinocytes, and in um, animals such as uh, mammals, uh, the outermost uh, layer of uh, cells are dead keratinocytes, essentially, you know, cells which have died and become bags of this protein keratin. Keratin then also composes um, and many other epidermal uh, structures, uh, such as keratin composes hair, it composes feathers, it makes up these reptilian uh, scales, it makes up nails and claws, as uh, we will see. Uh, keratin is largely a waterproof um, uh, protein, not entirely waterproof. A little water is lost uh, through uh, the scales, uh, uh, through the skin uh, every day, um, but largely waterproof. And so this covering in uh, scales was a great adaptation uh, for uh, life in more arid areas compared to uh, amphibians. Uh, now, as you can see on this head, there are a number of different kinds of scales. Some can be uh, larger, uh, and smaller, even on the same individual. Uh, they can vary uh, when uh, we uh, go from species uh, to a species. Some on the head can uh, form uh, more of an, uh, a thicker armor uh, for uh, protection, while along the rest of the body, allowing greater flexibility. Um, in order to grow, uh, uh, reptiles need to shed uh, this outer uh, skin so that then uh, they can increase uh, in size. Uh, this occurs more frequently in their early years, but this can occur uh, throughout life. Uh, what happens is because the scales are epidermal, uh, two layers develop and lipids accumulate between the two layers so that one, uh, the outermost layer can be more easily uh, uh, shed. And then the animal can, uh, can grow uh, before uh, the innermost layer uh, becomes, uh, uh, becomes uh, more uh, rigid. Uh, here you can see a lizard shedding uh, its skin and lizards will then eat uh, this uh, um, uh, the skin in order to uh, recycle uh, the, uh, the nutrients. Um, uh, snakes uh, tend to uh, shed uh, their skin uh, more in a single uh, piece. Uh, so they will start uh, with their head and, you know, using abrasion, rub uh, uh, their heads against something. And this will uh, then uh, start to tear the outermost uh, uh, layer from uh, the inner 
uh, layer uh, with the lipids between and they can shed the skin entire. If we were to look under the microscope at developing uh, scales in snakes, we would see that these are epidermal uh, structures uh, compared to uh, the uh, scales of fish, uh, which are uh, primarily dermal. And so, you know, fish have scales, reptiles have scales, but they are not homologous and they are completely uh, different uh, types of structures. Notice that the scales can vary on uh, parts of the body. So the scales underneath uh, the body uh, can be uh, larger and of different uh, sizes. Now, if we think of the human uh, epidermis, uh, there's the stratum basal uh, where the cells are dividing. And then by the time the cells read the, reach the stratum corneum, they are dead interlocked bags of keratin. And here we see the same thing on the scales of, of reptiles. Uh, here's the connective tissue of the dermis. And then underneath uh, that were uh, the chromophores uh, where pigment uh, can uh, be added. And so uh, reptiles are often very colorful, um, but this uh, color is not shed when the reptiles shed their skin because the chromophores lie in the dermis um, deep to uh, the uh, scales uh, which uh, are shed. Okay. And so here are the chromatophores. Um, uh, they are uh, in uh, uh, the dermis. Um, there's a hinge region uh, between uh, the uh, uh, scales uh, which make them more flexible, um, but the scales are a continuous sheath. And so uh, that is why in snakes it can be shed uh, uh, entirely um, because uh, each scale is not an individual structure, but the, uh, the keratin uh, forms this uh, continuous uh, sheet uh, over uh, the uh, structures. Uh, there is muscle, there's skeletal muscle in uh, snakes just uh, deep to this. And so uh, this uh, is important in, uh, in the movements uh, allowing uh, snakes uh, to crawl uh, and then also uh, allow uh, you know some movement of uh, the skin. Uh, so here you can see uh, the scales of a, a rattlesnake. Uh, once again, in a single individual, uh, they can uh, vary in a size. They can be larger on uh, the underside. Uh, they can be more uh, resistant to water uh, movement depending on a snake's habitat or the, depending on the species. Here you can see some of the variation in the uh, coloration of snakes. Once again, it is the chromatophores uh, in the dermis which are providing this color, even iridescent uh, colors. When rattlesnakes shed their skin, a hard um, uh, button of keratin is added to uh, the rattle each uh, time. Uh, and so that unless it were to break, uh, the size of the rattle would be an indication of the age of the rattlesnake. So if you look here, uh, here is a very long uh, rattle uh, from a rattlesnake uh, indicating a number of, you know, uh, sheddings. Uh, the uh, coloration uh, can serve for uh, camouflage or for warning. There are snakes which are venomous and their bright coloration uh, serves as a, uh, a warning. And then there are even non-venomous snakes which mimic the uh, coloration of these venomous snakes so that predators which learn to avoid the brightly colored coral snakes might then also avoid um, non-venomous uh, snakes, which are uh, mimicking, uh, uh, mimicking uh, those. Uh, scales uh, can then take on different uh, structures and can even, uh, you know, be narrower and resemble, you know, eyelashes uh, or form wispy ends and be a little hair-like in uh, mammals um, or resembling, you know, the hairs of mammals, but these are just modified uh, scales in, uh, in reptiles. I had mentioned uh, that turtles have shells which uh, compose these epidermal uh, uh, scutes uh, overlying uh, dermal bone. Uh, these were not the only 
uh, organisms uh, to develop this dermal armor. Um, obviously, this skull uh, is com largely composed of dermal bone. And so um, starting with jawless fish, the first bone developed in the dermis as dermal bone. And while vertebrates use this for uh, their uh, skull, with the exception of the cartilaginous fish, it doesn't have to stop there. So once the genes are present to be able to make bone within the dermis of the skin, uh, this can then occur elsewhere throughout the skeleton. Now, uh, notably, there were armored dinosaurs, which then had dermal bone in uh, their skin. Um, but uh, there is dermal bone in the skin in a number of groups. Crocodiles uh, make dermal bone in uh, their skin. Uh, armadillos make dermal bone in uh, their skin. And then this can be covered by hard epidermal uh, scales. So uh, this would be separate from uh, the scales which we observe, you know, in lizards and snakes. So this would be, you know, a different uh, type of dermal uh, armor. Their relatives, the uh, ground sloths, uh, also had um, a dermal uh, armor. Uh, and so uh, there uh, are uh, variations in uh, you know, these uh, structures uh, which uh, can uh, develop. In the same way, uh, when we look at you know, that type of dermal armor, like forming a shell-like structure, uh, it evolves separately in uh, different uh, groups. And then we could say the same for horns. So what do we mean by a uh, horn? Uh, well, it uh, varies. And so therefore, uh, if we were to truly discuss horns, we would distinguish between, say, horns, uh, and I'll go to the video in a second, uh, which are only truly known in bovids. Um, uh, here you can see the bone underneath uh, the um, the keratin of uh, the horn. Antlers would uh, be different, uh, which uh, are covered by a, a living skin or a velvet, uh, which can be shed. Uh, antlers, you know, varied the uh, most significant antlers being in uh, the Irish, uh, the Irish elk. Uh, but then there are other forms which we see in giraffes, and they're extinct uh, uh, relatives. Here's the okapi, which is a, a small giraffe uh, today. That's known as an ossicone. Um, and then there were other extinct groups of mammals, such as the protoceratids, which made horns. Um, uh, here are brontotheres, which are relatives of rhinos, which made horns with a bony core, uh, but modern rhinos don't have true horns. This is just keratin. There is no bone uh, inside. And so uh, then what we mean uh, by horns uh, varies. So just a couple of, you know, uh, examples. Um, we uh, classify horns as true horns as only existing in uh, mammals, um, but obviously uh, horn-like uh, structures are known in a number of groups of uh, dinosaurs, both ornithischian dinosaurs such as the ceratopsians or some of you know the uh, the uh, theropods here as well. Um, uh, those scales of, uh, of uh, composed of keratin can become uh, thickened and uh, can produce horn-like structures, say, in, um, uh, in uh, chameleons. And sometimes horns might appear in one species only. So pigs in general don't have horns, uh, but there was a, a fossil pig which possessed a horn-like structure. And so horns are sometimes known in uh, groups, uh, but they can vary, you know, whether it be chameleons uh, being unusual among lizards or that pig uh, being unusual. Um, so a true horn uh, is uh, known only in the bovid mammals, such as cows, sheep, goats, bison. There is a bony core, which is unbranched. This is covered by keratin. Horns are typically present in both genders, and uh, they aren't shed uh, throughout uh, life, and then typically uh, get uh, longer and longer um, as the animal uh, grows. And so once again, uh, uh, cows and cattle, you, know, you first saw the auroch, which is uh, a wild relative of the uh, uh, progenitors of uh, cattle. Here we see bison, which are closely related uh, to cows, and then goats and 
uh, goats and uh, sheep uh, can have uh, these true horns. Antlers are different. Now, antlers do have a bony core, but it is branched, and the number of points tend to increase uh, with age. Um, it uh, is at first covered with living skin, which is then shed. Uh, this is known as the velvet, uh, and this then leaves bare bone. Uh, antlers are typically present only in male deer, um, but the exception is in reindeer, where both males and females make uh, the antlers, and it typically is shed annually, which means that this grows each year. This is actually the fastest growing bone known in all, um, in all vertebrates. Uh, so that uh, is uh, significant. Um, uh, the uh, most primitive deer alive today, such as uh, those in Vietnam, uh, and also uh, the most primitive fossil deer lacked antlers. And so antlers were not present in the first deer. There are still a few other uh, variations. So for example, uh, uh, giraffes have what are known as ossicones. The bony core is uh, unbranched, uh, uh, but it started off as cartilage, which was then converted uh, to, uh, uh, to bone. All right, uh, and so uh, it is covered by uh, living uh, skin, uh, which is not keratinized, and they are present in uh, both uh, genders. Uh, it should be noticed, uh, noted that uh, in addition to uh, the okapi, uh, which is a, a giraffe with a short neck alive today, and the uh, long-necked uh, giraffe, there were a number of fossil species uh, which had uh, then variations on these ossicones, some were the size of moose antlers. Um, there is a, a type of um, an artiodactyl out west known as the pronghorn, uh, which has a forked uh, bony core, although the, the bony core uh, of the horn is uh, more branched in uh, mammals, I, I'm sorry, in males. It's covered by a keratin sheath. It's present in both uh, genders, um, but this keratin sheath is shed annually, but not the bony core. So that is one more variation on uh, these horns. So here out uh, west, you can see the, uh, the prong horn. And once again, this is different from the horns of a rhino. While rhinos had relatives uh, called brontotheres, which had a bony core uh, to their uh, uh, to their nasal uh, horn, there is no bony core uh, to uh, uh, that of a rhino, and it is composed entirely of uh, of keratin. It's present in uh, both uh, genders, uh, and uh, it is not shed annually, uh, developing uh, throughout uh, life. And so uh, here, once again, we see keratin and how versatile uh, it is. So keratin not only you know, composes the outer skin, uh, but also then uh, composes um, uh, these uh, horns. Uh, keratin is uh, also uh, what forms baleen. So there are toothless whales. Um, uh, actually, as embryos, they develop uh, teeth. Uh, but later in life, uh, uh, the, the, the teeth uh, are not uh, permanent. And then uh, baleen, is a structure of keratin, which allows them to filter the water. So if a whale takes in water in its mouth and then forces it out, any living uh, uh, animal, so shrimp-like krill, for example, would then be caught and not pass through the, um, uh, the uh, uh, and not uh, pass through uh, the baleen plates, which serve then as a, uh, a sieve. And so uh, there are all of these uh, diverse uh, structures uh, here. Um, the next keratin uh, structure I'd like uh, to uh, mention is hair, all right? Now hair uh, only truly exists in mammals. But that being uh, said, there are certainly other organisms that look hairy. And so the, um, uh, the cuticle, the epidermis of diverse uh, organisms uh, can uh, form, you know, bristles which look hair-like. There are even some feathers 
uh, which can look uh, hair-like. Uh, there are fish whose outer covering looks hair-like. Uh, there were, apparently was a hairy, uh, hair-like covering, uh, covering uh, pterosaur uh, flying uh, reptiles, uh, but true hairs are known only in mammals. It should be noted uh, that um, while all mammals can have hair, even you know things like whales can have uh, a few uh, hairs along their body, the hairiness of uh, an, in a species can vary. So you know, modern elephants are relatively uh, hairless, uh, but they certainly had hairier uh, relatives in mammoths. There were woolly rhinos. Uh, there are uh, uh, rodents which have hairs. There are uh, rodents uh, which are relatively uh, hairless. Uh, the same can be said of um, uh, of uh, pigs. Uh, hairs can certainly vary, and in uh, porcupines, which originated in South America, some of which migrated to uh, North America, uh, hairs can be um, uh, stiffened and therefore uh, be able uh, to serve uh, to a, uh, a greater uh, extent in uh, in a protection. Um, and so uh, hairs are a mammalian uh, feature. Uh, there were uh, mammal-like reptiles which seem to have had hairs, or at least they seem to have had whiskers, and whiskers or vibrissae are a modified uh, type of hair, which are very important in sensation, all right, so hairs can have that role of being sensory. Um, not only, you know, can say uh, a rodent going through a burrow be sensing things with its uh, uh, its uh, whiskers, uh, but also, I mean, there are so many in, uh, insects and other ectoparasites such as lice and ticks and fleas, uh, and so you know, something moving a hair can serve a sensory function as well. Uh, the hair itself is made of cells which are full of keratin. So once again, here is a, uh, an adaptation of uh, that uh, protein. Um, although a, a hair is an organ, and so not only is the skin an organ, technically the definition of an organ is that it's made of uh, multiple tissues, but each hair, as you'll see, is then technically an organ. So in addition to the epithelia of uh, the hair itself, then you have the surrounding follicle uh, sheath, and then part of the sheath is epithelia, and then part of the uh, sheet, uh, sheath is a uh, connective uh, tissue. So hairs do have multiple uh, tissue uh, layers. And so that is the definition of an organ. The hair itself, you can see, has an inner medulla, an outer cortex, and then a single uh, layer of cells known as uh, the cuticle. Now, epithelia are avascular, which then obviously is, is a problem. If you don't have a blood supply, how do you get oxygen and nutrients to cells uh, which are uh, dividing. And so therefore, if we were to look at the um, hair follicle, uh, you would see here that there is an important region of the dermis known as the papilla. And here is the papilla of the dermis and the papilla of the hair, uh, which has blood capillaries. This is where the oxygen comes from, the nutrients come from, which will promote uh, the matrix of the hair, which is where there are epidermal cells, which are uh, dividing to produce the hair and making the protein keratin. Also found here would be uh, melanocytes, uh, which uh, would then contribute to uh, the pigment of the hair. So here in the hair follicle, we have both a connective tissue papilla, uh, where the blood vessels are, and then the actively dividing cells of the matrix, complete with melanocytes uh, around uh, around uh, this. Okay. Um, now, uh, as I had said, uh, the hairs can be wrapped with sensory neurons, which give them a sensory uh, function, and then they can also have smooth muscle attached known as erector pili muscles. When this smooth muscle contracts, it can cause the hairs to stand erect. Um, this could help an animal warm. So I'm wearing a sweater and the sweater is creating like this layer of dead air here. So if the wind were blowing, 
you know, I, I, my skin would not be exposed to the uh, uh, to uh, the wind, but rather would be surrounded by this capsule of air which wasn't uh, moving. And then the same thing is true here. If then hairs were to stand on end, then that would create an insulating a layer of air, which would help keep an animal warm. Uh, obviously, hairs can also serve as emotional displays. So when, say, a cat has its hair stand up on end, that you know signals. Uh, other you know animals around you know what that hat uh, what what that cat is uh, is feeling, and so uh, these uh, erector pili muscles can serve a number of roles, uh, but then even in humans a role that is um, uh, is performed is that when these hairs stand on end, it helps to pump these glands known as sebaceous glands, which then uh, cause a uh, a, a moisturizing lubricating sebum uh, to go onto the skin and hair. So keratin itself is dry and brittle. And so sebaceous uh, glands uh, provide this uh, conditioning sebum and it is the erector uh, pili muscles pulling on the hair which help to pump uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, gland. There are other possible uh, modifications of uh, the uh, the skin as well. So, for example, there can be uh, ridges which uh, follow the uh, lines of dermal uh, papillae, um, which uh, then in uh, primates uh, are found in areas uh, that are used uh, for gripping. Uh, obviously, very important in uh, primates. Uh, the amphibians uh, lack any keratinized uh, structures at the tips of their uh, digits, with the exception of uh, a few. So there are, for example, spade foot toads, for example, or xenopus, uh, which have keratinized um, tips on their digits. So they have uh, nails. Um, but uh, other than that, that is not a feature of amphibians. But in all amniotes, that is the case, where the very tip of the digit has a, a, rid, a, a keratin forming a, a, a claw. Uh, this is more rigid in reptiles and birds. Um, mammals tend to have softer uh, claws uh, because there are different types of keratin and then there's a different uh, type of keratin uh, produced uh, here. But here you can see uh, an opossum. Uh, there are both uh, uh, hairless areas uh, of the digits which look uh, scaly. Um, and then also there uh, here is a claw and while there are primates which possess claws, most primates uh, possess uh, flattened claws, which are called nails. So a nail on this monkey is really just a flattened uh, claw. Um, but once again, all amniotes uh, and a couple of amphibians uh, possess keratin at the tips of uh, uh, the digits. Um, then finally, in this video, I'd like to uh, say a, a little bit about uh, feathers. So uh, first, uh, let's take uh, what are known as contour feathers and just go over the structure for uh, comparison. So um, the feathers we're most familiar with uh, have what are called veins, where uh, they are lots of barbs uh, all forming a kind of a sheet, a blade, which is flexible and that uh, this um, uh, set of uh, barbs can be on either side of a central shaft known as a, a rachis. So uh, once again, uh, we're, this is the type of feather we're familiar with, so let me start uh, here. Um, some of these can be used in flight, and one of the interesting things about uh, flight feathers is that they are asymmetrical. So if you look at the vein on the anterior, the forward facing side, it's narrower as opposed to the posterior uh, face. This is for aerodynamics. Also interestingly, when we look at fossil organisms such as say, you know, the early birds like at Archaeopteryx, uh, one can determine whether they were flying uh, because uh, they have asymmetrical feathers. Once again, that's an adaptation uh, for uh, flight. Here on this red-tailed hawk, 
uh, once again, you can notice here's the central shaft or rachis, and notice that uh, the vein uh, is asymmetrical, narrow on this uh, side. Uh, the very base is hollow and is known as the calamus or quill. Um, and then here uh, one uh, sees the, uh, the shaft which proceeds uh, from uh, this. Now, these contour feathers have this central uh, shaft um, and then have barbs coming uh, from the central shaft. But what the barbs do can vary. So some of these barbs are, uh, are not interlocking and are known as plumulaceous barbs. Uh, they are uh, not uh, rigid, um, they are not interlocking, while other uh, barbs uh, coming from this central rachis can be called penaceous in that they are more rigid. And so from this rachis, barbs come, but as you can see, there are different types of, um, of barbs. Now, if you were to look under a microscope, the barbs then have uh, smaller barbules coming from them. And then coming from the barbules are even smaller barbous cells, which once again can interlock and form a blade uh, so that uh, the vein can be a thin uh, unified uh, structure. Although as you saw with the plumulaceous uh, barbs, that does not have to be uh, the, uh, the case. And so here you can see there can be like this thin blade which is formed, um, but uh, once again, does not have to be the case. And here you can see you know, the interlocking nature uh, of this. So feathers can be extremely uh, complex. Now, uh, there is a great deal of terminology which can go along with uh, bird feathers. I, I'm just kind of introducing uh, some basic, but for example, the flight uh, feathers can be called uh, remiges. Um, and um, they can then be divided into primary, secondaries, and tertiaries. And the, um, uh, uh, they uh, are not for insulation, but they're rather uh, stiffened to uh, absorb the forces of flight. Um, but, and then we can use uh, the term rectices uh, for the feathers on uh, the uh, tails. Now that was a contour uh, feather. Uh, those little feathers were perhaps most uh, familiar uh, with. Once again, there are uh, barbs on either side of the central uh, rachis. But as you can see here, there are different kinds of, uh, of feathers. So once again, contour feathers, perhaps what we're most uh, familiar with. And this would include you know, both uh, the flight uh, and tail feathers. But then there are also what is known as downy feathers. So if you were to see those young Canada geese, uh, they did not, you don't see contour feathers there, but instead downy feathers. Notice that here on this downy feather, there is not a central shaft or a rachis to which the barbs are uh, attached, but instead the barbs then attach to the calamus without a single central uh, rachis uh, coming uh, from that. And so uh, these are downy feathers. They are primarily used uh, for uh, insulation. And once again, a reminder uh, that feathers can perform numerous functions. You know, they're not just for flight. Um, birds are warm blooded and just as mammals can have hair uh, to help insulate, um, birds can have uh, feathers and it's these downy feathers uh, uh, which can help uh, with insulation. Notice that uh, the uh, barbs um, do not uh, interlock the way that we saw on the, um, on, uh, the contour uh, feathers. Uh, there are still other types of uh, feathers uh, in addition to uh, downy uh, feathers as well. So here is what's known as a semi-plume feather. If you were to ask, you know, which is it? Well, it kind of looks downy, but it kind of looks also like a contour um, feather. It kind of looks in between. So semi-plume feathers are kind of in between the other two. There is a central shaft or rachis, um, but uh, the barbs are more downy. And these can be used for insulation found, say, in between uh, contour uh, feathers. Uh, there is also what is known as a filoplume uh, feather. Uh, this is very simple, where there's just a simple uh, shaft, a uh, rachis, which then can end in one to six barbs. Uh, it is primarily used as a sensory function so that some, something 
you know, a displacement of the barb could, you know, show something or while flying the displacement uh, of these uh, phyllo plume uh, uh, feathers can help um, birds, uh, you know, sense, uh, uh, you know, wind speed and position in the air and um, be used for aerodynamics. Um, phyllo plume feathers are not known in uh, the uh, primitive um, birds a lot today, uh, like uh, uh, the rat tights, uh, those, um, uh, anyway. Uh, so uh, another type of feather is known as a bristle feather. Uh, and so like this bird looks as if it has eyelashes, but that is a modified type of, uh, of feather. Uh, so feathers serve for multiple functions that not in addition to flight, they can also serve a sensory function. Those eyelashes protect the eye um, and obviously for insulation. Um, but because of the coloration of feathers, they serve you know, roles in courtship, in identification of species. And just as melanin is the primary pigment of, uh, of mammals, and uh, I, I go through a little bit here on the genetics of how uh, melanin uh, pigmentation is uh, produced. The same is true of birds, where melanin is the primary um, a pigment. So when you see a black bird, a brown bird, a, um, a gray bird, it is melanin primarily, uh, which is uh, being produced uh, to uh, cause uh, these uh, colorations. Uh, there are uh, melanin, uh, in addition for many things, it absorbs light, obviously that could have a role in heat uh, absorption. It also then has a protective uh, a role. Um, and so very often uh, melanin can be found on wing tips uh, because it helps protect uh, uh, the feathers uh, where they need more. Another uh, set of pigments which can uh, affect feather color are what are called the carotenoid pigments. Uh, these are producing the reds, the oranges, and the yellows. These are uh, modifications of uh, dietary things that birds eat. So uh, the birds modify things that they eat to produce these pigments. And then interestingly, a female bird could then look at a male and see how brightly, color, uh, brightly colored he is and then get uh, some indication of how well nourished he is. And as a female is choosing a partner, maybe then you know, how well nourished her um, male partner is, is a sign of that male's fitness. Um, the liver breaks down uh, red blood cells, uh, which have hemoglobin. And then in, for example, in mammals, uh, this heme, can be produced, uh, converted into bilirubin, which has a pigment. Um, but in birds, heme can also then be modified to form a set of molecules known as porphyrins, which produce a number of brown hues uh, and can be found in some birds such as these owls. Um, those are pr the primary pigments of birds. Now, you might think that I've omitted some because I haven't mentioned the white pigment or the blue pigment of this blue jay, or the bright iridescent, you know, uh, pigments of the greens of, of you know, some uh, parrots, etc. And then this is a bit more complex. They're not really pigments. And, and so you can, you know, extract brown pigment from brown uh, feathers, um, but, or red, you know, carotenoid pigments from red feathers, but you can extract a green pigment from green feathers or blue pigment from blue feathers or white pigment from white feathers. Instead, the structure of the feather and the molecules within then scatter light differently. And so when white light, which has all of, you know, the, the hues in it, hits these feathers, it is scattered in such a way, and then certain pigments are reflected, that when you look at these feathers, you see blues or greens or iridescent uh, colors. But once again, that's not because there's a, a molecule that can be extracted, which is white. You can't dye clothes white based on, you know, a white pigment extracted from white feathers. Never, that was how light uh, was uh, being uh, reflected. Now, finally, these feathers, you know, especially the condor feathers are so complex. You know, it does kind of beg the question as far as, you know, where did feathers come from? Um, well, we now know that there were feathered dinosaurs. And so then the question, you know, comes, you know, 
how could dinosaurs have evolved feathers? Well, feathers seem to be derived from scales, right? So um, here's uh, the scales of a snake. And the scale buds embryologically look like the feather buds which develop in a developing bird. And there are some, so here you can see in a bird, the skin as it's developing its feather uh, buds. And there are some similarities between the embryological formation of these feather buds and the uh, development of scales. And on a bird's body, there are places where there are scales, like the legs, places where there are feathers, but no places where there are both. So it seems to be an either or that these embryological structures, you know, then are directed towards forming either uh, scales or, um, uh, or feathers. Uh, feathers have uh, interconnected tissue and then are formed by keratin. So once again, uh, just like scales, um, uh, it is keratin which composes uh, these, uh, these feathers. Now, while feathers can be extremely complex, all right, as in these uh, flight feathers, there are then also simpler feathers. And so feathers didn't have to start off as being complex. Downy feathers are simpler than contour feathers. Um, and they don't have to have the structure needed for flight. You know, just if a reptile could produce a fluffy scale, that would then uh, serve as insulation. And obviously there's an advantage to being warm blooded. You know, you can live in different parts of the world. You can maintain a temperature differently. And so uh, uh, feathers serve lots of roles. Uh, feathers can be sensory, as in these very simple uh, uh, filiplume uh, feathers. Um, and the earliest uh, dinosaurs, the, the basal position ones, uh, which had feathers, um, they have these simpler types of feathers. So simple feathers came before complex feathers. Now, some individuals looking at these would prefer to use the term proto feathers, which is you know, obviously fine, uh, but we have a growing list of the theropod dinosaurs, which possessed proto feathers. So before feathers functioned in flight, they functioned in probably uh, keeping uh, animals warm and promoting being warm blooded, or maybe they were pigmented and um, uh, had roles in uh, courtship or camouflage. You know, so brown birds can blend in with brown vegetation, green parrots can blend in with green leaves. And so, you know, feathers could serve a role long before they had roles in uh, flight. Um, and then interestingly, uh, there is actually a fossil of a dinosaur tail, which is covered in what would uh, perhaps accurately be called proto feathers. And so proto feathers uh, are much simpler than contour uh, feathers, uh, but nevertheless, they have a central uh, rachis. They have uh, barbs that do not interlock. And so uh, some uh, predatory dinosaurs had a feather-like covering uh, on their body, but it was uh, very simple in its structure. So we know this from impressions and fossils, but once again, they're actually amber fossils which preserve these uh, structures. Um, interestingly, there were uh, dinosaurs known which had flight feathers, you know, Velociraptor, um, uh, a number of uh, 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 Protoarchaeopteryx, Claudioteryx, uh, a number of dinosaurs had flight feathers, which would not have been capable of flight. This then asks the question, you know, well, if, you know, these animals couldn't fly, they were too heavy, uh, what were they doing? And once again, uh, perhaps this served in courtship or species identification, or maybe if you were grasping uh, prey, you know, having uh, these uh, contour feathers in the arm help, you know, produce kind of like a basket almost. Or if these animals were jumping at their prey, and certainly a number of them had switchblade claws on their legs, suggesting that they were using their feet as weapons. If you were to jump and you had these flight feathers on the arms, tail, and even legs, I uh, that this might help you glide a bit and extend a jump, or perhaps steer in midair. But in any case, these feathers seem to have uh, evolved from scales, and they seem to have evolved in stages where the simplest feathers uh, came uh, first uh, for, uh, uh, you know, perhaps for thermoregulation, and there are even um, then fossils of slightly more complex feathers, which were simpler than those of 
uh, you know, the contour feathers. And so here are just, you know, an introduction into some of the broad uh, diversity of integumentary structures which can accompany the um, cutaneous membrane. The one group that I've omitted is the, are the glands, which will be described in the next video.